Welcome to Hustle and Pro. Our guest today covers both the hustle and the youth side of sports and the pro side. Welcome, Scott Secules. Scott was an NFL quarterback for six years and another 15 within the college sector and now uh, leads a team who helps with youth um, athletics. How are you, Scott? Great. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm great. All right. So I want to jump into a, a couple quick hits to get to know you better. Who is your all-time favorite athlete? Boy, that's a tough one because mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're making me pick sports there too. Well, I know. That's my next question. Um, you can go with a few if you need to. Well, you know, I, I as at a point now with someone that played for three different teams in the NFL, uh, I root for the offense. So I like watching great quarterbacks play. So it would have to be a great quarterback. I don't know if I really have a favorite. But, you know, guys now, uh, you know, I love watching Tom Brady play, Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers, those guys that do it at a high level. You know, I was lucky enough to, to spend four years really close to Dan Marino in South Florida with the Dolphins. And, mm-hmm. and that was a... Uh, a great experience just to see, you know, be that close to greatness, really. Yeah. So then how about this? Thinking back when you were a kid playing, who was your, you know, idol that you were looking up to? Well, I grew up in Northern Virginia as a Redskin fan. So Sonny Jurgensen and Billy Kilmer, to date the really old people, um, uh, were the quarterbacks then. They won a Super Bowl with Joe Theismann. Um, and, uh, you know, there were some great quarterbacks and some great teams uh, that were part of the Joe Gibbs era and the George Allen era uh, in DC. So those were that was my my team. Okay. You know, because I was probably a football fan, worse you know more so than any other DC area sports. Even though I was uh, adamant about cheering for something all year round. Right. So that was another question. Then what's when we talk about your favorite sport to to watch, and then versus your favorite sport to play yourself, what do you got? Oh, I I. I I'm too old to play a lot of them anymore, but, you know, I, I still love watching football. You know, I, I will sit and watch a football game. I won't watch a baseball game unless it's the World Series or playoffs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of the same with, with, with basketball, although I'm a, more of a college basketball fan, I think, than the NBA uh, until playoff time. But, and I also watch English Premier League soccer. Mm-hmm. I will have a cup of coffee on, on a Saturday morning and watch uh, an EPL game and, and thoroughly enjoy that. But, you know, I think it's more so that uh, I've always had a great appreciation for something being done well, uh, and I love watching guys at their craft, mm-hmm. you know, regardless of what it is. Right. What about distance? So the farthest distance you may have traveled to either play yourself uh, as a player or to go watch sports? Well, to play is an easy one. In back-to-back years when I was in Miami, we played in um, Berlin and in Tokyo. Wow. The dreaded preseason games mm-hmm. that had to travel. So uh, we played the Raiders in Tokyo and um, in the Tokyo Dome. So that was probably the farthest. And then the second farthest was our, we played the Broncos in Berlin um, and actually stayed in East Berlin and drove through the Brandenburg Gate wow. going to and from practice. Wow. And, and we practiced, we played in Olympic Stadium and practiced on um, the parade fields, which is, has a big stone tower where you know, Hitler used to stand and watch the troops. Who would have thought playing yeah. football would take you there? Yeah, right? it was an amazing experience. Um, and then uh, when our son was at playing at Jesuit, uh, they played in Dublin. Oh, really? Yeah, they, they were part of a group of Catholic schools that went over, and Notre Dame and Navy played in Dublin as the marquee game, and wow. they played three or four high school games the day before, and the Jesuit kids got to go. So That's as a high amazing. school sophomore... You know, the, they took the JV kids as well, and they all got to go to Dublin for a couple of days. It's pretty nice for a high schooler. Well, you mentioned earlier I didn't want to make you pick a sport, so now I'm going to make you pick a favorite team of all time. Now, I know you've played on several teams, like you said, but just kind of taking a step back, sort of favorite team you, you grew up as a fan of or, or even that you were on or associated with. Favorite team. Hmm. Doesn't have to be a season either. Some people pick a specific team, but just in general. Kelly, that's a tough one. You know, I, I'm I, I'm going to claim Switzerland and all this and stay as neutral as possible. Um, you know, I mean, I grew up a Redskin fan. I'm not a Redskin fan anymore. You know, I, that changes as soon as Mr. Brandt called you on the second morning of the mm-hmm. draft and said you want to be a Cowboy. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, but, you know, I don't really root for anybody in particular. You know, my Virginia Cavaliers, it's been great to see them have some success lately. 
uh, as an alum. You know, I'm proud of that, but that's a challenge for us to keep track of in Dallas versus the East Coast. Uh, we don't get a lot of ACC news here in Dallas. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I would I would say that I'm really not. I'm more of a sports fan versus a team fan. Gotcha. You are probably my first guest that that doesn't immediately have a favorite team, but you have a different perspective than the rest of us. Well, when you not... when you've played for multiple, right. you, you you learn that your allegiance goes to a paycheck. Yeah. You know, and and uh, that's kind of why I like watching good offense. Yeah. You know. I, yes. I love a good quarterback battle. So you you you. Got ahead to my first question already. You alluded to this. So in 1988, you were drafted by the Cowboys. So I want to know what you remember most from that day and tell me how that went down. Well, it was, amazingly enough, back in 1988, Mel Kuyper, who still has the same haircut and the same hairline, um, was a draft guru uh, back then, and I was a sleeper. You know, this kid out of Virginia that had started one year um, was a sleeper and, you know, who knows when you're going to get drafted. You could go as high as, you know, the speculation that goes in. And the draft was a couple days back then, and the first day came and went, and I didn't get drafted. Matter of fact, I think only one quarterback did, Chris Chandler out of Washington. And um, then the second day, Don McPherson from S- some Syracuse went to the Eagles, and then in the middle of the sixth round, um, the Cowboys called. So just an amazing thing. I mean, that, that whole process of going from a career backup to playing one year in Virgi- at Virginia, and we won eight games. We won a bowl game, the second bowl game in the history of the university. And all of a sudden, my phone's ringing, and I'm getting messages from the football office that somebody wants you to work out. Did you not expect it? No. You I mean, back was, then, it's yeah. not all the hoopla. Yeah. And there, you know, you, you went into a season you know, with, with no expectations other than, okay, you know, it's your turn to lead it, you know, after, after standing in the wings for so long. Um, and that's something I'm proud of because in this day and age, all you hear about is everybody transferred. You know, it doesn't work out for you, so I'm leaving to go find a better pasture. And, you know, I backed up a guy that, that went on to have a, a very nice NFL career, Don Mikowski, played for the Packers, went to the Pro Bowl. Um, Don and I were classmates. I redshirted. He didn't. So I was a year behind him. And and it got to be my year, and we took advantage of the opportunity. And then all of a sudden, you know, you got coordinators and scouts coming to Charlottesville to work you out. So uh, it was really a surreal experience. And then to get drafted and come down here and see the business side of things, mm-hmm. you know, that you very much, you very quickly walk into a locker room. And, and I'll still remember to this day uh, an offensive lineman that had gray hair that was like a 13 year veteran, you know. So if I'm 22, you know, here's a guy in his mid thirties. He's got gray temples. Yeah. Wow. You know, the, and and the span of the game because you know you know in your other experiences, you're a sophomore playing varsity in high school. Big deal. You're yeah. coupled in. You right. know, you get to Not college. Much, yeah. You're 18. You're 19. They're 22. Everybody's all, fairly close. Yeah. You know, the same playing. All field. of a sudden, you walk into a locker room that's got people that range from the Randy Whites and the Danny Whites and the Tom Rafferty's and two tall Joneses of the world to little old rookie Seekills. Young guy out of uh, school. Yeah. 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 You mentioned the hoopla. I mean, the draft is so much hoopla and we, we watch it on TV and all that good stuff. But who, what do you remember as far as um, who called you, you say? It was Gil Brent. Okay. Yeah, who went into the Hall of Fame this year. So, you know, one of the iconic Dallas Cowboy names, uh, you know, Mr. Schramm and, and Gil Brent. Gil, was, Gil ran all the personnel. So it was Gil that called that, that second day of the draft. Now, you were there, you were only in Dallas a little while, right. but was that during the end of the Landry era? It was the la- Coach Landry's last during. year. Coach, okay. La- yeah, Coach Landry's last year was, was my rookie year, so I got drafted with guys like Michael Irvin and Kenny Norton. Um, actually, there were a bunch of us from that draft class that went on to have nice careers in the NFL. I mean, all the way down to you know our 11th round draft pick. Chad Henning was our 12th round draft pick that year. Um, you know, and, and I had forgotten that uh, until recently looking at a list because he went off to serve in the Air Force and then came back and had a great career. So he was part of that same 1988 draft class. But then when Mr. Jones bought the team and they drafted some guy named Aikman and some guy named Walsh, uh, there were lots of young quarterbacks in the quarterback room. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, so we went to training camp my second year with Steve Walsh, Troy Aikman, Babe Loffenberg, and myself, and I got traded. You know, I, I learned the, the 
part of the business that means you walk in the door one day and Coach Johnson looks at me and says, we've traded to the Dolphins. Your plane leaves LAX at 9.30. Wow. And so I took, that was it. And I took a yeah. red eye from LA to Miami and I'd never been to Miami and had no idea where I was going. And I had a bag full of shoulder pads and helmets and cleats and another bag full of training camp clothes and off I went. Wow. I was going to ask if what, from your perspective, with with that transition time, the you know, of Landry leaving and everything, how dramatic it probably was from the mm-hmm. other side. I wondered what you felt from being a first year player and a rookie in the locker room. Like what what did you guys feel or think about all of this drama that was seeming to go on with the team? Well I, I think you learn real quick on the business side of that that it's up to you, you know, it's the the Patriot mentality or the NFL mentality to do your job. That you have a job to do. Um, and you need to do it to the best of your ability, and whomever is in that leadership role needs to see that. And, and I think you realize that very quickly, that you couldn't get caught up in the transition or the emotion uh, that, that that whole situation was charged with because you had a longtime iconic coach that um, left a position that he'd been for years and years and years with great success, and you know, in comes Coach Johnson and, and a new owner and a new coach. So... Um, I, we tried to just stay focused. You know, it was in the middle of the off season, so we were working out, so that that nothing changed really. So then you were off to Miami, and you were with the Dolphins for three years. Four years. Four years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then off to the Patriots, right, for a season. So which um, was free agency? Which, okay. Yeah, which which the that, that ninety three year when we we finally got free agency in the NFL as I was a union rep for several of my years in the league, and so we finally got that free agency and. You know, got a chance to go to New England and and be a part of uh, um, building something up there and working with a young quarterback and Drew Bledsoe, who was drafted first in the draft. Um, and you know, so I was the old guy, using my air quotes here, uh, the old Four guy. Four years old, and yeah, the big guy. Twenty eight, almost twenty nine years old that during that season um, to work with the young guy who was twenty one at the time, um, and and got to start some games. So. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll always value that time. We we weren't the greatest team in the world, and I'm sure I wasn't the best quarterback for that fit. But, you know, what we went up there to accomplish, it was a neat experience that on four or five Sundays in my life, I was a starting quarterback in the NFL. Under what coach? Bill Par- Parcells. Parcells. Yeah. Right. What do you uh, take away most from working with him, under him? Well, I, you know, I think Bill was, was – uh, really at the forefront of, I think, managing an entire roster full of guys and realized that you coached 53 guys really 53 different ways. You know, there wasn't one way to coach, which I think the mentality had been. You know, it was a very, you know, and it's what we talk about a little bit um, with what we're doing now, that the, in, in that day and age, coaching was so militaristic. Coach said it, you did it, and if you didn't question it or you took off and ran a lap. Um, whereas now coaches today, bless their hearts, deal with the kids looking at them and saying, well, why? You know, I think I'd pull my hair out what yeah. little I have left if, uh, if you had to deal with that. But, you know, I think Bill was really on the cutting edge of that. You know, when, in working with me versus a young rookie, you know, he, would, he had told me several times, that, hey, there are going to be times when I'm yelling at you, but I'm not talking to you. I'm he just talking, needs to I'm say talking it. to the kid next to you. Yeah. He needs to hear it, and it might be loud and directed at you, but he's listening. Okay. Yeah. You know, whatever it takes to, to better the team. And I think you realize that uh, in your career. And Bill was really masterful at that. Yeah, I was going to say, he seems to have a distinct point of view or style. I wondered if you, if if it's hard to align with, you know, a pretty, um, I don't know, I was going to say powerful, but not powerful, um, just a unique personality that he seems to have. Yeah, strong personality. Strong, I, yeah. I think you, you got to learn to get along. And that's part of anything we do. And any job we have now is you've got different personalities that you have to be able to um, adapt, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that's one thing that business shows you just like any other business is you adapt to different leadership styles. Um, I think the good coaches today have figured out that there are different leadership styles for different types of people. Um, you know, guys like Pete Carroll, um, some of the, you know, Sean McVay, some of the young guys mm-hmm. have, are really on the cutting edge of some of those things and uh, I, I think that's a gift, you know, and that's what I think separates the good one. Look at the job the guy in Pittsburgh doing, Mike Tomlin. You know, I mean, they start off poorly. I heard guys talking this morning that, you know, they sh- they could be coach of the year for the job that he's done mm-hmm. managing their injuries in the roster and all the different changes that they've had there. So, you know, 
And that, and that's the good thing that we get to see and learn from those coaches, even though we don't play from them, just watching them from afar. And you talk about all the things that those coaches are managing and more and more of those now in the modern day era of things like players putting their opinions out there or doing things that cause a little bit of a, you know, Twitter world. Uh, right, rough, yeah. uh, rest, what are social it? media. Yeah, social yeah. media. So are, how glad are you, are you glad that that was not a factor when you were? I am thrilled that that was not a factor. I mean, just think about that in the day and age, we would stop and have some team fellowship on the way home from practice or meet our wives and have dinner and a, a, a beverage. You, you almost can't do that anymore. You know, there's somebody with a camera, there's somebody looking out for you. And, you know, if they tell the story, they control the narrative, whether mm -hmm. it's true or not. And that's so unfortunate. And then others and can judge and, yeah, and react um, to it. No question. It's so and, easy to react to what could be nothing. Yeah. And we, and, and that's one thing that I think, you know, we talk about in, in some of the, the coaching workshops that um, we as humans are great at judging and passing judgment. And that applies to our coaches too, as they try to criticize and correct their players. It's yeah. like, you know, hey, look, let's be careful because that gets into uh, managing the emotion and the motivation of a player. Uh, and if and if you keep being negative, it beats them down and they don't get to play at their fullest. Right. Do you think the public perception and how much access the public has to these, to be able to have these judgments, um, do you think it's um, how it affects the players. So, for example, now when when a player puts their personal agenda out there and everybody gets to weigh in, um, that obviously didn't happen as much in the '90s, right? Um, yeah. When you were playing, well, it. What I guess my question is: Was it still happening? We just, as a public, we weren't aware of it. Well, it was. It happened on a lot higher level. So, you know, the the guys in the in the Boston Globe were still very vocal about the fact that they didn't think I was a very good quarterback. The fans in the stadium let you know. Um, you know, there were those kind of filters, but there wasn't somebody chirping at you on Twitter or, you know, websites that said fire Coach X or yeah. Coach Y or something like that. So I think it's a lot more, it's a lot deeper now. You know, there there were times when you didn't listen to talk radio or you didn't read the sports page. And now I'm sure that, you know, that's why you see guys go quiet on their social media during a season. You know, LeBron James has done that a couple couple mm -hmm. times. You know, some years he does, some years he doesn't. But you almost have to really be very good with your own personal filters, I think. You know, because there is somebody out there telling you that you didn't do a good job, whether you did or not. And if you're about, you know, if depending on how you, you know, intrinsically motivate yourself or if it's extrinsic, you got to be really careful with what you let in, right? Right, to yeah. let that affect you. Yeah, no question. Right. Because ideally, you know, you're trying to create this, and this goes again to the coaches and the organizations, you're trying to provide a climate that allows for the best possible performance. And how do you insulate, how do you educate your athletes, your employees, to guard against those things and be mindful of them and make good choices in how they digest so they can perform at the highest level and they're not dealing with you know, something between their ears that's mm -hmm. going to get in the way of them playing at the highest level. Because after all this, you know, the business of pro sports is about winning and it's, and you win when you have guys playing at the highest level. Right. So you mentioned some names that we've all heard and, and know um, earlier. So how do you manage those relationships? Do you keep relationships with some of those guys now after you've I, been I really out don't. The for a long time? You know, I think one thing you see in there is there are kind of two ways to step away. You either step away and close the book or you try to keep your foot in the door. And, and I kind of made a conscious decision that I, I was not going to. Um, you know, there's still some teammates that I keep in touch with, uh, more so on the college level, mm -hmm. um, you know, guys I went to school with. Uh, but, you know, I, I think if I ran into a former teammate, we'd have a nice conversation and catch up about how old we are and how, <laughs> how old our kids are now, yeah. amazingly enough. Uh, I mean, you know, our oldest was born when we were in South Florida. Um, the Marino family had several kids, and Danny just became a grandfather again, I think. So it's like, dang, we, we are getting old. Um, you know, I saw that on social media. But, you know, it's a, I just kind of decided that I was not going to be that guy that kind of clung on. You know, I was going to be thankful for my experience, uh, and I was going to close that book. And, you know, my kids don't know me as a quarterback in the NFL, they see pictures or helmets on my shelf in my office mm -hmm. um, that can prove that, hey, I did this, or 
you know, what really freaks them out is that even 25 years later, I get football cards in the mail. Thank you, internet. Yeah. But I get actual mail that, uh, and they laugh and say, oh, dad, I got some more fan mail. And someone tells you how great you were and that they're such a big fan and would you please really? sign my card? That's great. Oh, it's it's, it's funny. staggering. Um, I actually had an interesting situation a couple weeks ago. My cell phone rang. I answered the phone. It was a number I didn't recognize. But when you're in the external business, you answer the phone and listen to the stuff. Guy goes, oh, yeah, you know, such and such. I met you when you were with the Dolphins. I was cleaning out some of my memorabilia, and I have a jersey of yours. Would you like it? Sure. Sure. So I, I, all of a sudden I get a package in the mail that has one of my Dolphins jerseys from like 1989, that's um, pretty cool. And, and a picture that I had signed for this guy, that I was sitting on the bench with Mark Duper, who was one of our great receivers, and my little chicken scratch autograph is in a black marker on the side of this picture, and he sent it with a little note that said, hey, hope you're doing well. Aww. But, you know, that's out nice. of the blue. Yeah, out of the blue. You know, that, 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 that trumps getting a football card in the mail. Right. So I had some guy call me and go, yeah, you want one of your jerseys back? Sure. I think that's pretty cool. So when you made that decision to kind of, like you said, close that chapter, move on, um, you ended up still staying in sports and in football, right? But in the collegiate level. Well, I got into the, kind of the, uh, the administrative side. Administrative so so side. what we did the first, the first year, we played the who's going to get hurt game, which I think lots of guys do when they don't end it on their terms. Yeah. You know, the salary cap kicked in uh, after the 93 season and, you know, old backup quarterbacks were one of those things that kind of, kind of got pushed out. Mm -hmm. And so um, at the time we owned a lake house down in deep East Texas, outside of Jasper on Sam Rayburn Reservoir. Um, and we had just had our second daughter. Um, and I still vividly remember um, little kids and my wife who's from Dallas and we were 25 miles from a town of 2000. Wow. Uh, and it was a very healthy year, unfortunately for quarterbacks. So uh, the season came, the season went, and nobody called. So it was kind of a long, protracted shutting of the book. Mm -hmm. But when we finally shut it, and my wife looked at me and said, okay, hey, we got, we got to get out of here. You know, this isn't going to work. Uh, we went back to Dallas, and that's when I went to work at SMU. The guy that was um, a great mentor of mine uh, ultimately became um, my AD at Virginia, just got the job at SMU, a gentleman named Jim Copeland. Um, and I walked into Jim's office. Jim had gone to Virginia, uh, had played eight years for the Browns as an offensive lineman and kind of looked at him and said, hey, I'm interested in staying in sports. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I navigate this? And, and he had just taken the job at SMU and said, well, I need some help raising money. Um, would you be interested in this job? And amazingly, I took a job uh, as the uh, associate director of the Mustang Club at SMU, uh, and I made less in a year then my game check was mm. my last year in the league, you know, which was the first year of, of, of uh, free agency. Real life. Well, it, it, yeah. it was. It was real life. I laughed at, you know, hey, I couldn't, couldn't wear flip-flops to work every day. I had to shave a lot more often than I did. Yeah. And, you know, things like that, that that you kind of a different grind, don't right? embrace. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. A very different grind. But, you know, went in there and then spent 12 years with him at SMU and we built stadiums and we, you know, rebuilt athletic programs and had a great time and, um, went and did that at Virginia Commonwealth, uh, in Richmond, Virginia for a couple of years. Okay. So SMU was first. Yeah, SMU that was, was a 12 first. year run yeah. at SMU. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we were there for a long time and, you know, over the course of that time, I did just about everything in the department, but sit in his chair. Uh, so you got to see the business side of, of athletics, got to, you know, be involved in marketing and PR and communications and uh, all the different aspects that go into an athletic department and really get a lot of great experience. Which I would think is fascinating. Um, college athletics is such a big business. Oh, it's exactly right. It has grown into that. And right? Yeah, it's probably. So my question for you then is being in that administrative role um, for 15 years, you probably saw some real shifts and like cultural changes and just how things are done in sports and um on college campuses. So what are some of the things that you look at now, now that you're out of it and realize are just such major changes from when you were in it? Well, I, I think the, the transfer rules are really, have really changed things. You know, it seems like that whole portal concept that, uh, that it's new in, in, in especially college football and college basketball, uh, have really had a huge impact. I mean, you know, you look at the, the great teams, uh, this fall in college football, how many of them have transfers? 
and how many of them were woven together because kids transferred from another very successful program. Um, I think that's an issue. I think this whole debate over paying and, and their likeness in marketing and stuff mm -hmm. like that, that's been needed for a long, long time. Um, so I'm great. I'm grateful to see that come, you know, it has become a business. There are universities that are making lots of money off the likeness of these young men sure. and young ladies. And, and, uh, I have no problem with them being paid, oh. being paid and compensated for that. I, Student I think, athletes. Yeah. I think that's yeah. coming. Um, you know, I think you learn that it's a very different business and, and it, you know, you're, you're part of the business in that you're an asset when you're playing in the league you're managing those different assets. And the assets are everything from your logo and your mark and all the inventory parts and all the signage that you have and all the stuff that uh, make up ways to make revenue. And that's ultimately what it's become. I mean, it's staggering to think about a, a program like Ohio State with a $100 million athletic budget, you know, and, and a football team that puts 100,000 people in the stands seven times yeah. a year and, you know, is excellent in everything they do. Um, and to see the arms race that has become facilities, mm -hmm. you know, spectacular. And then around here in North Texas to see what that has become at the high school level. Right. Um, you know, in my travels around visiting with athletic directors, I'm in awe of some of the beautiful facilities that these high school kids are playing in. Uh, and I think back to what we had, which in my time in the league, Valley Ranch was beautiful. Right. That was cutting edge. In Miami, we were in the back of a little St. Thomas University in a building that uh, would probably fit in the weight room at Valley Ranch at that time. Um, but we had great fields because they grew good Bermuda grass in South Florida. Uh, and then in, my, in New England, we were in the stadium, in old Foxborough Stadium that we lockered every day in the exact same locker room that we got dressed up. There was no separate practice facility. There was a, we drove to grass fields about two miles away from the facility. And the bubble was on the far side of the parking lot, which we practiced inside from the first week of November until the end of the season because of snow in New England. What's the, I mean, what's the going rate? Does every NFL team have a separate practice facility than their playing field now? I mean, is that without just question. absolutely? Yeah, without question. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, and, and, and in the business sense of things, if you go look, and I, I've noticed this when ESPN cuts to, Cleveland or Indianapolis or something, and they show the reporter talking about the team, there's a logo on the side of the building that's mm -hmm. not the team's. You know, it's Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland Browns Practice Facility, mm -hmm. you know, or, or whatever they, they are. So, you know, they're sponsorships. You know, they're, they're logos around the star, mm -hmm. um, sure. you know, that, that, that are, are part of that engine that make it work. And, and you know, I think there's so much facilities wise. It's not the recruiting pitch. I don't think that it is in college. Right. Um, you know, I mean, you go to someone like Oregon that has 14 different color helmets and 14 different color jerseys or something like that. I mean, there are high school teams in North Texas right now that have three helmets. I don't know where they store them. Right. They you build know, a new facility. Well, they have, you know, where our son went to, went to school, they have three helmets. They have four or five different colored jerseys and they have four or five different colored pairs of pants. Amazing. They, yeah. they play 10 games. Right. <laughs> they don't ever wear right. the same thing twice. Then they got to hire a, yeah. a, a, a fashion person board. to figure so, out what they're going to well, wear each game. Where are they? Well, I think they, they've, let the, they've let the captains pick it. Sure. But, but, you know, the business side of things have really changed. You know, I think the, the, the different revenue streams, the internet and social media and all that stuff has opened up a whole can of worms with how college athlete college athletics is covered, is discerned, is judged. Um, you know, I could think about that. You know, yeah. I mean, the same the same filters that you put on uh, on pro sports, there is nothing that keeps it from trickling all the way down. Right. Uh, even to high school sports. You know, and that's the sad thing that we see parents get in arms about a coach that you know they don't like because they're not playing their kid the right way. And if they know the right person, that kid, that coach's job can be in jeopardy. That's just tragic. It is. Yeah. I was going to ask before we move on to that, I want to talk to you about that, but um, at the collegiate level, how involved were you with those vocal alumni who want to put their two cents in literally, I guess, and, and their opinions? Um, how much did that impact you as an administrator? You, when you're on the external side of the department, which was my role, um, you're knee deep in that. 
you know, especially when you're in a situation, we did not have a lot of success when I was at SMU. Uh, so invariably, every few years, we'd go with, hey, it's time for such and such to go. We need to make a change. And, and, and if we ultimately did, you know, I mean, the economic engine's involved. There are buyouts in these contracts. You know, I, I saw recently that the coach from Florida State lost his job five games into the year. It's going to make seventeen million dollars. That's crazy. Uh, and and they're five games into the year. Yeah, and they're taking grief down there because they're trying to say they didn't go raise that seventeen million to buy him out. Well, you know, I don't know if I believe that or not, but you know, that's that's the the world we live in nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, that hey, look, if I make the right couple phone calls to the right donors. Um, you can make and say, hey, we need to make a change and we're going to do it now because that gets us ahead of the search and I can start moving covertly with a search firm and start putting feelers out there and, you know, by the time the season's over, we're ready to go. Um, it, it's just an amazing part of it. But, but you know, that again, what drives the economic engine? Those donors. Uh, and you have to listen and you have to not deflect, maybe just right. li listen craftily and... Because and they're acknowledge paying. because yeah. you have to say, hey, thank you for your input uh, and thank you for what you do because their support is critical to operating these um, mega, mega departments nowadays and all of them, quite frankly. You know, I think you even see at the smaller levels, the, the smaller schools that have more developed fundraising operations have a few extra resources to do things they want to do. You mentioned parents, so I want to just quickly touch on your today, you know, what you do today in sports. That's a whole nother conversation, several conversations. We've talked about this a while um, before this podcast, and we'll talk about it some more, but you work for Positive Coaching Alliance, so you're the Senior Regional Manager and Partner and in Partner Development. You oversee all partner development for the whole state of Texas, mm -hmm. so what does that look like? What teams, wh who do you work with um, when you say the whole state of Texas that you're, and what is your goal as in this role? So, so Positive Coaching Alliance is a national nonprofit, as you know, that works in the youth sports space to try to develop kids into the type of young people we want in our families and our communities. Um, we have 21 chapters across the country. We happen to have three in the state of Texas. We have a North Texas chapter that that covers the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex and extended out to Tyler Longview, Denison, Weatherford, Waco, you know, a big, big circle. Uh, we also have a Houston chapter and we also have a Central Texas chapter. Uh, what I do is work with the partner development staff in those two chapters to help uh, support them throughout the year and sell across the area because what we do is work with youth sports organizations and schools and school districts to remind them that youth sports is about developing kids more so than it is winning games. Uh, and in the land of Friday night lights here in Texas, that's a hard swallow sometimes. I can imagine. Uh, you know, that we're, we're talking about stories of high school coaches that lose their jobs because of overzealous parents, and yet we're trying to get those same parents to listen uh, to our models. And, right. and, and the fundamentals of what we do uh, is we're about trying to shape culture. You know, and we're in the culture change business, and that is a slow, arduous process. But if we can continue to train coaches and train parents and train the athletes on what their role is in a positive uh, character-building youth sports environment, then we can change things uh, for the better. And, and the parents, you know, very simply what we try to tell our parents is that um, we see problems when parents get their noses into the playing and the competing and the winning part. Mm -hmm. You know, what we want our parents to do is focus on the teachable moments and the life lessons that their kids learn as participants in sports and not be so caught up in how many points they scored or what they, you know, how many touchdowns or how many goals or, or those things. And, and where you really get in trouble is the parents that are living vicariously through their kids. Right. You I know, see it. Yeah. <laughs> that might not have had great careers or might have had great careers, but they see their child as another chance to bring adulation on them. And one of the first things we tell a group, group of parents in a workshop is that, hey, let's remember this is not about you anymore. This is about your kids and that's the focus that we need. Uh, and as simple as that sounds, 
it's incredibly difficult at times. It is. I mean, you're a parent. You have, did you have three athletes, three kiddos that were athletes? Uh, all in, in different levels and okay. in different times of their lives, yeah. Okay, so it is harder. Um, you naturally want to see your kids do well, especially in a sport that you enjoyed or played or whatever. So it is, for me, I naturally want to to push my kids, but I have, you know, I have to consciously make sure I'm taking the right role, step back, say the right things, give the right support mm -hmm. and guidance and right. not say the thing, you know, there are times to, to just not say anything at all and let them figure some right. things out. And I do think it's hard. It's a struggle, but your group is actually, um, I've been to workshops and so I really like the message and I do think it's super important here. And like you said, the land of Friday night lights and I'm not even a football parent, but I'm in the world of it. And so all the other sports I'm involved in, it's a tough position. You have to learn how to be better at it as a parent, I think. I, I think that's, that's a great way to put it because I think, you know, we, we put all the focus on getting better on the kids, you know, and, that, and that's a big part of what kids want in youth sports. You know, I think uh, we talk to youth league coaches about kids wanting to be connected. You know, they want to be part of that team. That's important to them, something bigger than the family which is such an important lesson. They want to know they can get better, and they want to be part of something that operates with integrity. And yet we have coaches that will stretch the rules and not play kids the right amount and put the wrong kid on their team. And, you know, it, it amazes me right now we're, we're dealing with the University of Memphis. And, and, you know, they're playing an ineligible kid that's the number one recruit in the country that the NCAA has deemed ineligible, and they went and got a temporary restraining order on that order. So there's a kid that's knowingly ineligible that they're playing, and they could lose their entire season. You know, they could lose any opportunity, and and but they're probably trying to get this kid a couple games so he gets drafted sure. up. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, just the ethics that that get lost. And, you know, and it breaks my heart to hear the stories of parents fighting in the stands or getting mad at an official, and the official's 18 years old and trying to earn $15 a game. They for, are doing the best yeah. they can do. They you don't want to, yeah, they're not there to make everybody mad, yet the parents forget that, that that's their So the, the neat opportunity goal. that we have in trying to change culture is that we deliver a, a consistent set of terms, a consistent language across the players, the coaches, and the parents that kind of lays the foundation for a good positive culture. And if we can do that, then kids will come back and they'll keep playing. Um, and we can remind coaches that, hey, your goal this year should not be focused on how many games you win or lose, but that every young person on your team comes back. Wants to come play that for they you. Have, that they have fun. Yeah, that they uh, still enjoy the yeah. sport, that they enjoy you as a coach. Right. They've learned something enough to where they come back and do it do mm -hmm. it again, keep playing. And a lot of times that's just focused on having fun. Right. And we, and we forget that. Right. You know, and I think one of the great, the great things that we've learned too is that, you know, coach, parents have a goal. You know, and when we talk to the parents in our little sessions about what are your goals for your child's sports experience, and, and invariably all the good stuff comes out, you know, teamwork and learn to lose and learn to win and, you know, make friends and all these things. And then there's a couple parents that will raise their hand when we talk about winning, you know, that that's important to them, or, or scholarship. Scholarship. And, and they might be eight or nine years old, and they're already focused on scholarship. Mm -hmm. and, and we quickly kind of redirect the conversation to say, hey, but what are your child's goals? You know, because if you're running around with a 10-year-old and your goal is to get them a scholarship because you see that as the way to not have to pay for college, and their goal is to be with their friends, friends. and have fun, mm -hmm. I mean, that's not a bad thing. It's, that's a source of a great conversation over the dinner table, you know, to make sure you're on the same page yeah. and that you support their goals. And if the day comes that they say, hey, you know, mom and dad, I want to play in college then great. It's our job as parents to try to help them get there. And they're going to say the same thing to their coach, and their coach is going to do everything they can in their power to provide them an opportunity to have a chance to play. Mm -hmm. It might not be at the Ohio States or the University of Texas of the world, but there are lots of places if they want to play. Right, sure. Um, and what we've seen sometimes is those kids that are coming from high school indoor facilities and multiple color helmets look at this Division three college and go, oh, my God, their facilities aren't as good as what we had Step in high school. Step down. I'm just going to go be a college kid. Right. I don't want okay. to play. Yeah, and, and, that and, and that's a fine. decision they sure. need to make. And but it's not okay if the if the narrative since you're 10 was that you have to go get a college scholarship and play yeah. in college. Yeah. And then there's disappointment. Okay, so will you come back and do a, a, a Positive Coaching Alliance topic of episode with me? Okay. 
Good deal. Well, um, thank you. I know I've, I've taken a lot of your time today, but thanks for coming up here to Frisco and chatting with us. We'll, we'll invite you back anytime My you want to come back. My pleasure. I really appreciate the chance. Thank you.